Well, we're through our last full week in the month of April, and I hope this finds everybody safe and healthy um, through this week. Um, thanks for joining me again um, as we continue to work through our study of Paul's letter to the Romans. Uh, last week, we took a look at the portion of Romans chapter 8, which I think I mentioned um, is one of my favorite chapters in the New Testament um, outside of the Gospels. Um, and it's really rich in content um, in this matter of um, helping us feel secure um, through our relationship with Christ um, and this sure hope that we have in, in him as Savior. And you'll remember, you know, Romans chapter 8 sort of opens up with, um, therefore there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And it finishes by reminding us that there are, um, is nothing that can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So we have this great sense of security um, that comes through our relationship with Christ. Um, and it's this latter truth that we were once sinners and we were destined for doom. Um, but now through Christ we are saved through the redeeming work that he did on Calvary's cross, um, it's this idea of salvation now and being saved that is central to this week's lesson as we move to the 10th chapter um, in Paul's letter to the Romans. You know, part of Paul's heartfelt desire was that his readers in the Roman church would be saved um, and this starts in earnest if you look at chapter 9. Um, and he, in chapter 9, does this historical overview of the Israelites and how God had been in the controls all along or at the controls all along in bringing his people to this particular place and time where he was writing, uh, where Paul was writing. And this was all done despite their failures. And one aspect of these failures was the Israelites trying to pursue righteousness by works um, instead of by faith in Jesus, the only one who could lead them to the kind of righteousness that God desired. Um, salvation could not be earned through obedience to the law, but rather salvation was, on, was gained by believing in Jesus's completed work on the cross and believing him in him as Savior. So we'll see this message right away as we start looking at today's scripture passage. But before we do that, let's go to a word of prayer. Let us pray. Lord, we are thankful that you have brought us through another week. Um, and although we're living underneath restrictions um, although that we have limitations to our freedom that we're not used to, um, one thing that has stayed the same throughout all of this is that you're with us, Lord, and you're for us. And that's never going to change. And so we, we gain a lot of comfort. We gain a lot of strength by knowing that whether we're restricted to home or whether we're free to do all the things that we would like to do in life, that you're with us no matter which of those is happening. Um, so thank you for being ever present with us. Thank you for being our refuge in times of trouble. Thank you for being our peace and comfort whenever concerns over this coronavirus might start to creep in. Help continue to strengthen our faith Help continue to feed our faith through the promises found in your holy word so that we might starve away our fears and that we might allow the words of Isaiah to come true in our lives, that we would um, mount up on wings like eagles during this time and that we run, might run and not walk. Um, 
but that we might be strong, uh, Lord, and that we might be able to be strong for others who aren't strong themselves. Lord, for those who have been infected and are struggling um, with this virus, Lord, we pray for your hand to be upon them. We pray for works of healing to happen, Lord. We ultimately pray for deliverance and restoration, for we know that you are a Lord that delivers and you are a Lord that restores. For all that are on our prayer list, Lord, who are struggling with health ailments right now, we pray that you be with them, Lord. We pray that you would continue to help uh, treat these ailments, cancers, and uh, other ailments that people might be going through, Lord, these afflictions. Um, we know you're the great physician. We're encouraged by news of how our prayers are being answered and Junior's tumor is reduced, Lord. We're just so thankful for that. We love him, Lord, and um, we're just grateful that you have got your hand upon him. Um, I remember the last thing Junior said to me before we ended up social distancing was that there's one thing that he knew for sure through all this and that it was that God loved him. And uh, Lord, we're grateful that you have wrapped your arms around him. We're grateful that you wrap your arms around all of us. We're thankful for the security that we find through the promise of salvation, that no matter what this life might bring, that the best is still yet ahead for us. Let us hold on to that, Lord, as we turn to our lesson today um, and we see what your word continues to say about the idea of being saved, not by anything that we do, because we can't earn the gift of salvation, but that the simplicity in being saved comes in just believing in Jesus and that he can simply save us just through our faith in him. Open our hearts and minds to the study of this word today and thank you again for being with us and continuing to watch over us in every way as we pray in your precious and holy name, the name above all names, the name of Jesus, the only name by which we can be saved. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Well, as we turn to Paul's words in chapter 10, I want you to think about how you might seek to gain favor from others. Um, ask yourself how many of these things that you might have done to gain favor involves you actually doing something. Um, in other words, you know, do we try to gain favor with others through our works. Um, I think we all do this. I think if we're really honest about ourselves, we'll see that we're always maybe trying to do things for other people to gain their favor. And I think this becomes a frustration sometimes for people in that they think that, you know, they're just never going to be good enough for somebody that no matter what they do for them, it seems like they never seem to gain that person's favor. And it can be very demoralizing, you know, for people. And I've met a lot of people and I've talked to a lot of people about this. Um, and maybe, you know, the problem is, is that we're trying to gain favor from the wrong places. And I think that sometimes the Lord is teaching us that really um, finding the favor that counts in life isn't found by trying to do things for other people or even do things for him but you know favor comes whenever um you know we just have our faith in god that just through our faith that um and our belief and trust in him that that's what he desires the most you know from us and you know this idea is really counterintuitive for us um and it's sort of been that way for the ages um you know, we want to please God from our actions. And in fact, some people have even convinced themselves that, you know, their good works can um, be their ticket to a place in heaven. Um, maybe you've heard people express this attitude before and this belief. 
that people think that if I do enough good things and if they're a good person, and again, this idea of being good would be, you know, that this is how the world sees us. And maybe you've heard people, you know, say that about somebody. Oh, they're a good person, so I'm sure they're going to heaven. Um, but, you know, there's only one problem, you know, with that particular kind of mindset. And, and that's that none of us are good, right? I mean, not one person, none of us are good. I mean, we looked at earlier in Romans, and, you know, it's pretty clear, right? Paul puts it out there that we're all sinners. Um, and the point has already driven, been driven across that all sinners fall short of God's glory. In other words, we are all out of favor with God because of our sin. And there is no place in heaven, no place with God for eternity for a sinner who has not accepted Jesus and chosen to trust in him as their savior. That's just truth. And you know, that's truth that maybe is hard for some people to hear, but we have to speak truth and love to people. And just being good is not enough to get you to heaven. Um, being good minus Jesus is only going to get you into torment um, and eternal damnation, that kind of mindset. That would be the kind of mindset that Satan is going to instill in somebody. Um, think about the garden, you know, um, when God had, you know, given Adam and Eve the order to not eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. They could eat of any other tree in the garden, but that was one tree that God said, do not eat from. And what happened? You know, here comes the serpent, and the serpent's like, oh, you know, you shall not surely die. And what happened? You know, the Adam and Eve were tempted, and they ate. And the rest was history, right? From that point on, mankind was afflicted, you know, with um, this sin disease. Um, and it was only through the atoning work of Jesus, who was the final sacrifice for sin, once and for all, um, that we even had a chance to bridge the separation between us and, and God. And so through Christ, we find our way to God the Father. And Jesus said in John 14, 6, that I am the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. Um, so these words are truth, and um, the only way to the Father is through the Son. Um, it's not through any works that we can do. Well, the Jews had, you know, come to think that, you know, they could gain a place in heaven by doing everything that the law commanded. And this was the law that we know that God gave them through Moses, you know, when they were on, you know, on their wilderness journey to the promised land. And they stopped at Mount Sinai and Moses goes up the mountain and God gives them the commandments and he comes down and he shares them with the people. And the people felt that, you know, their works, in other words, fulfilling the law would be enough to find favor with God. But you see, God expected perfect compliance. In other words, <clears throat> breaking one commandment was just as good as breaking all of them. I mean, if you broke one, you were you were breaking them all. And none of that was good in God's sight who hated sin. And so no Jew could perfectly comply with the law. And so none of them could meet the gold standard that God had set. In other words, none of them could do anything that would be good enough to earn their way to eternal life um, because all of them were sinners and all of them failed and all of them fell short of the glory of God. So that was the state of where people were at before Jesus. You know, here were the people and here were God. Here was God and there was this separation. And um, so there was no way because of sin that the people could be with God. So what happened? Well, listen, God out of his deep love, not only for the Jews, not only for his chosen people, 
but for all people. He willingly chose to give up his own son, give up his own son Jesus, as the atoning sacrifice, as I mentioned, that was needed to pay the sin ransom that was owed by the people. And in doing so, God made salvation a narrow path, and one that started at a narrow entry path, entry point, and that was, you know, the gate, the narrow gate, and that Jesus talks about that. To enter into the narrow path, you had to go through the narrow gate, and that narrow gate was himself, was Jesus. And for those who were willing to do this, to enter in through the narrow gate and then walk the narrow path to life, um, those, were, those people were the ones that were promised to live forever. Not because of any of their works that they had done, but only by way of faith and grace alone. That was it. So with that, um, let's now look at our first verses in our lesson. And we're going to start with verse 4 in Romans chapter 10. Now, this isn't in your student guide, so I hope you have your Bibles handy with you. Um, for we're going to start at verse 4, and we're going to read through verse 10. So here's what Paul writes. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness for, to everyone who believes, and since Moses writes about the righteousness that is from the law, the one who does these things will live by them. But the righteousness that comes from faith speaks like this. Do not say in your heart, who will go up to heaven? That is, who will bring Christ down? Or who will go down into the abyss? That is, to bring Christ up from the dead. On the contrary, what does it say? The message is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. This is the message of faith that we proclaim, that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And one believes with the heart, resulting in righteousness, and one confesses with the mouth, resulting in salvation. Well, here we find Paul drawing a contrast and a comparison between righteousness as it is applied to by the law in righteousness through faith in Jesus. On one hand, the belief was that through works, which meant obedience to doing what the Lord required, one would find eternal life. Um, and Paul quotes Old Testament scripture here, Leviticus chapter 18, verse 5, Leviticus 18, 5, when he says, the one who do, does these things will live by them. In other words, the way to live, you know, now and eternally um, would be the one who does these things, which means the one who would be obedient and compliant to the law. Now, remember that Paul was once a fervent Jew before became, becoming a Christian. So he was well versed in the law as well as Jewish religious attitudes, since he was once there himself. And we know Paul was a very fervent Jew. In fact, he persecuted Christians as Saul before he had his Damascus moment with Jesus um, and then, you know, converted and um, became a Christ follower. Um, so listen, there could have been no better person um, to teach about the difference in righteousness between the law and Christ Jesus than Paul. Um, look again now at verses 6 through 10. Um, you know, no works were needed by any person to bring Christ down from heaven, and ditto for bringing Jesus back to life from the tomb. I mean, God did both of these things, and he did it willingly without any person's help. God didn't need man's assistance to do any of these things. Um, he did it out of the great power that he had that nobody else did, and he did it out of love to save those that he cherished so much. And, you know, John puts it this way, um, see what love that the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. And this is from 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. Um you know, this entrance into the family of God uh, comes one way, 
And that is only through belief in Jesus by faith. That's it. Um, and this belief in Jesus by faith is sort of framed up um, with two, um, let's say, action points, faith action points for people um, found in verse 9. And what's it say? A person needs to confess that Jesus is Lord, okay, and then believe that God raised him from the dead. Um, belief, right, in God raising him from the dead and confessing, and you could just say you're confessing it because you believe it, that Jesus is Lord. And this is putting your full faith in Jesus as your Savior. That's basically the sum of, of these two items. Um, and any person who does these two things will be saved, um, not by carrying out some kind of challenge requiring tasks to be done in order to qualify for heaven. I mean, God doesn't give us this, you know, checklist and, and there's all these items and tasks that we need to carry out and, you know, like a to-do list. And, um, okay, I did this, check, I did this, check, I did this, check, I did all these good things. Um, and now that my checklist is, is all done and I've completed my qualifications, now I can, you know, turn this into God and, um, and, and then I will be saved. That's not how it works. All we have to do is believe with our heart and confess with our mouth and salvation comes to us. That's it. That's as simple as it gets. The gospel is not hard. Finding your way to eternal life is not difficult. It just requires a person to surrender themselves, to put their trust in Christ and Christ alone for their salvation. He's the only way to the Father. That's all we have to do. People make it hard. You know, they, they don't want to surrender themselves. They don't want to surrender what this world offers, and they're willing to give up salvation um, because they stubbornly will refuse to just believe with their heart and confess with their mouth that Jesus is Savior. It's sad, but it's true. So, you know, does this apply only to the Jew, um, or are the Gentiles now able to attain salvation, something that, you know, they didn't feel was possible before. Remember, the Jews carried themselves around like they were God's chosen. Um, and if you were a Gentile, which was essentially just being a non-Jew, you know, they were pushed off to the fringes of the society and culture, and they were treated like they had no hope, you know, that salvation was only for the Jews. And, you know, a secondary question, you know, is this salvation by faith? Um, and not works. I mean, is it is it really open to everybody? I mean, is there anybody that's excluded? Well, we find Paul providing these answers uh, answers to these questions in our closing verses. So let's look at verses 11 through 15. So Paul writes, for the scripture says, everyone who believes on him will not be put to shame, since there is no distinction between Jew and Greek because the same Lord of all richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then can they call on him that they have not believed in? And how can they believe without hearing about him? And how can they hear without a preacher? And how can they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Well, note the word everyone that's used here. You know, Paul makes it very clear that all, that everybody has the opportunity to be saved. There's no distinction anymore, and we're talking about first century AD now when I'm saying this, that there's no distinction between Jew and Gentile because the Lord now is the Lord of all. And he richly blesses all who calls on his name to be saved. This is a critical message that Paul is sharing. But note that 
it wasn't his exclusive responsibility to share. I mean, Jesus didn't just single out Paul when he gave the Great Commission. You know, rather, he was addressing all people that would choose to confess him as Savior, all people who would choose to follow him, and that includes us. Um, Jesus, he ascended to sit at the right hand of God the Father, but he expected that his disciples, um, those who were following at the time of his ascension, and every disciple and follower that would come thereafter, um, the expectation was that they would carry on his gospel sharing work, that they would be his hands and feet that would bring the good news of salvation through him to others. And, you know, indeed, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news? How beautiful is it whenever we have the opportunity to provide a message of salvation through Christ Jesus to other people, to give them a chance to go from where they are, and that's without hope, separated from uh, God because of their sin to a place of eternal hope and a chance for salvation to live with him forever. And indeed, um, all who will believe in Jesus, um, you know, they will be saved. But how will they know to believe if they don't first hear about him? Um, and that's where we come in. You know, we're tasked with getting the word out, taking the gospel to other people, sharing it. We should find every, every day we, sh we should find a way to do this. And even when we're social distancing, there's plenty of places and opportunities to share the good news. I know, I do it every day, whether it's on Facebook. Um, and I know I have more than a thousand, you know, people on Facebook um, that are friends. And every time I post something, it's an opportunity to reach out to that many people. Uh, Twitter, I mean, that's um, that's more than 13.2 thousand followers right now. So the Lord continues to grow that ministry. But just one tweet can go out to more than 13,000 people. And they can share it with other people. And, you know, if it gets retweeted, I mean, it can be reaching, you know, hundreds of thousands of people. You never know where the word might go. And you might never know where that word falls. And you might not ever know um, the quantum impact of the work that you've had sharing the gospel and how many people you have helped come to find their own salvation in Christ Jesus. Certainly, it's beautiful um, work that we get to do in the name of Christ. And listen, there's a world out there that needs to hear the good news. Um, now more than ever, right, um, you know, um, in these times that we're in, it's definitely time for us to follow Paul, uh, Paul's lead and help spread this good news of salvation to others, um, to let them know that all they simply have to do is confess with their mouth and believe in their heart that Jesus is Lord. Um, and now, as is in the first century AD that we're studying from, um, everyone that calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Jesus said, you know, that the harvest was plenty, but the workers are few. And we need to be, we need to be busy. We need to be about our father's business as Jesus was. Um, find a way to do that. Maybe it's just sending in a card of encouragement to somebody this week. Maybe it's sending an email to somebody this week. Maybe it's posting something on your social media, Facebook or Instagram or Twitter. Um, whatever means that you're communicating, there are all kinds of ways that we can be the hands and feet of Jesus and be sharing the good news of the gospel with others. There's just really too much at stake to not do anything. Um, and certainly, and not knowing what can happen any one given day, whether or not that might be the last day that we're living. Um, if you don't accept Christ as Savior and you don't do it now, 
yeah, you might not get another chance. And that's the truth out there for everybody. We're all going to die and we don't know when. So this puts some urgency, I think, into the work that Christ has called us to do. Um, and again, I pray this week that um, you will allow the Lord to lead you to the things that he would have you do by whatever method and means that he wants you to do it in order to share the message of salvation with others. Well, next week, we're going to continue to move along in our study of Romans. Um, you know, we're really sort of coming down the home stretch of this quarter. Um, as we'll be wrapping up Romans um, by, you know, the end of May. Um, you might be interested about next quarter. Um, next quarter, we'll be looking at Proverbs um, and the Song of Songs. So we'll be in the Book of Wisdom. We'll head into the Old Testament. And um, we'll see what we can do about um, student guides and leader guides for next quarter. Um, I may just go ahead and order some for the class and, um, and mail them to you um, so that you'll have the student guides and we'll have something to work off uh, next quarter um, until we're able to you know, get back together again and meet at church. But I pray all of you will have a blessed week um, and um, please stay safe and healthy. And um, if you need anything, please reach out to Grace and I and let us know. And we're standing by to help you um, in any way that you need it. God bless you all. Um, have a great week, and I'll see you next Sunday. God bless you.